thank you very much for that introduction. I have to confess to you that I just came from Detroit. <laughs> at one of those up at 4 a.m. catching the flight and the sort of hit and miss here, trying to make sure I got here on time. Um, it's interesting to talk about this subject slavery at Monticello and covering the lives of enslaved people at Monticello because yesterday or day before yesterday, I'm sure you know that there were hearings about the issue of reparations or thinking about the possibility of having a commission to think about <laughs> um, <laughs> reparations. And ta Coates mentioned Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, and he talked about, I guess came in the, the context of a phrase in which he's saying that a country um, is bound by its debts and its credits, and if Thomas Jefferson matters, Sally Hemings matters as well, making her sort of a stand-in or understand, a stand-in for enslaved people and the relationship between people who are enslavers and people who own people and pe those who were enslaved. I wasn't expecting to see that, and of course, I got a bunch of emails from people <laughs> saying, did you see this, did you see this? And I thought it was a very interesting thing that he brought to the fore. And it reminds me of how surprised I am in some ways that I'm still talking about this topic. When I first wrote about Sally Hemings, back in my book, my first book came out in 1997, I had sort of a limited purpose in mind. Up until that point, most people who wrote about Jefferson in the historical profession did not believe that Jefferson had any kind of connection to Sally Hemings beyond just that of a person who was her legal owner, and that that was the extent of the connection. And I decided to write my first book because I wanted to talk about the way people came to that conclusion, how historians wrote about the subject. It was not so much about did Tom and Sally have a thing or whatever it is you want to call it. It was how have historians written about this and what does the historiography of this particular subject tell you about how history is written. And one of the things that I noticed was that there was an imbalance or imbalance, non-weighted, well, a weighted way of looking at the evidence. When people said things that historians liked, they disregarded the problems with the statement. When people said things that they, with which they disagreed, then they found fault, nitpicky faults with the statements. And this was particularly problematic because the people who were saying that Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings did have some sort of connection were African-American people, particularly two African-American men who were on the plantation of Monticello, a man named Madison Hemings and a man named Israel Jefferson. We've since learned that his real name was Gillette. His real fa family last name was Gillette. And Madison Hemings said that he was the son of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And Israel Gillette Jefferson corroborated what he said, they gave these interviews to a newspaper man out in Ohio in 1873. Those statements were ridiculed. The suggestion was that either Madison Hemings did not know what he was talking about, he was making this up, or maybe his mother had told him this story about their family life out of vanity, trying to make them feel good, to make them important because they were connected to Jefferson in that way. Jefferson's grandchildren, a granddaughter and a grandson, gave separate stories about the question. They said that the reason Sally Hemings's children looked just like Jefferson was that they were the children of his nephews, one of his nephews. And that's not a crazy story. People can look like their cousins, they can look like their uncles. I mean, it's a, genes work that way, but they offered no evidence for that other than just their statements. And in fact, during the course of telling these stories, they said numerous things that were patently untrue. And typically when people try to convince you of something, saying things that are patently untrue, you don't believe them. 
it gives you cause to pull back from their statements. But that didn't happen in the historiography. People disregarded those problems with the narrative that they presented and went with the bottom line. He didn't do it. That was the important message that was taken. So this struck me as something that's worth you know, pointing out and exploring. Conversely, when they looked at Madison Hemings's statements and Israel Jefferson's statements, they fixated on tiny things. Madison Hemings at one point said that his mother was in France for 18 months, and she was there really for 26 months. Well, that's a difference, but we're talking about something that happened before he was born, recounting a story, he's in his 60s. Time is different. Those kinds of mistakes are understandable. Genealogists, when you, I'm not a genealogist, but I can tell from the, the resources that they use, have sort of a wide swath of things. If it's something is within a year or two or three years, it's considered something that is reliable and helpful. But here, little things like that were considered to be fatal to the story that they were told. On the other hand, when Jefferson's grandson said, I know that the children of Sally Hemings did not belong to my grandfather because she was given no special treatment, and I know that because during the time she was having her children, I was in charge of handing out all of the supplies to the enslaved people at Monticello. The problem with that is that Jeff Randolph was, in the years that Sally Hemings was having her children, between three and 12. So we know he was not in charge of handing out all the supplies. So something, and the people who wrote this about this, who used that particular letter, knew that. They would know when Jeff Randolph was born. They would be able to do the math. They would understand that this was an implausible story. But it didn't matter. The implausibility of their statements didn't matter because they were giving people evidence that they wanted to hear. So my first book was about that question and going through painstakingly looking at all the things that Madison Heming says that are right and some of the things that may be wrong and are those de minimis errors or are they important errors, looking at Jefferson's grandchildren's statements, looking at other things to talk about how you write about slavery. And again, it was not so much about proving this one way or another. It was about the way history is written. And I thought that this was important because it struck me as morally problematic that the people who were the victims of slavery, and they were victims, and Jefferson understood that. You know, he said that, he wrote that, he understood that he was victimizing people, that slave owners were oppressing other people. Typically, when we look at victims who come and tell you what their story is, you pay attention to that. You don't spend all of your time trying to make the person who victimized them look good. It's not a question where, of a question, did he or did he not? There's no question he was a slave owner. So that question is beyond. It's not a, a question of innocent until proven guilty. We understood that relationship, and it seemed that all of the attention was going to try to shore up his image and not figure out what the heck was happening at Monticello at that time, something that happened in many families in the South. This is not anything that's new. People who have been doing all of these sort of online DNA testing and the families patterns are up and people test them against them, show almost every one of many of the, quote, famous fam first families of Virginia, FFV as they call themselves, um, had children with enslaved women. So this was a, not an uncommon thing at all. It's, the problem was that it was linked to Jefferson and because what Jefferson means to people, and that's why Coates referred to him the other day, what he means to people meant that this was a difficult topic, difficult thing for people to accept. So I write my book, long story short, there's a DNA test that was not a strict paternity test, but was a test that established a connection between a Hemings descendant and Jefferson's descendants, the Jefferson family descendants, and no connection between 
the cars, the nephews who were supposedly the fathers of Sally Hemings' children. And there was a third question about a family called the Woodsons who considered themselves to be descendants of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, which I'd said in my book they were not, and likely not, and the DNA suggested that they were likely not. So these three questions, we think about science and the importance of science, and what I was really pleased about with that, particularly the car story, because I found that one kind of really offensive, uh, the car connection, is that these questions could be answered if you looked at the evidence and the material the right way. It could be answered historically. I mean, science was great to have science weigh in on that. I mean, I spent an interesting year waiting for the DNA to come back after I'd made these broad claims. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, it worked out. Uh, but, <laughs> it, but in some ways, I felt it, I wanted people to be able to look at the documents to look at the evidence and to weigh the evidence and come to a conclusion, because we're not going to have DNA for everything, right? And we're coming to decisions about things that don't have anything to do with paternity all the time. And the book is a consideration of how you do that. How do you go through evidence and weigh it and come to a conclusion, knowing that this is about probabilities, very seldom certainties, 100% certain certainties. Jefferson was the third president of the United States. That's a certainty. Things of that category. But things like this, paternity, I mean, actually, even among people who are married, <laughs> it's not 100% certain until you do have a paternity test with all the kinds of things that are required. And even that is expressed in terms of probabilities. So that's what my first book was about. The DNA came out a year after my book came out when the paperback was out, which was great. Uh, <laughs> fortunate timing. And I kind of thought that this would be, might be the end of it for me. I didn't have, as I was writing the book, a plan to do another book. But after all of this happened, it occurred to me that one of the reasons it was so easy to dismiss the Hemings family story is that people did not know the Hemingses. People talked about Sally Hemings and say, you know, Jefferson would never be involved with a slave girl. You know, like a slave girl tells you every single thing you need to know about this person, this human being. There's a, there's a, um, a, a stereotype. There's a, a, you know, a character, thank you very much, a character who is supposed to be the stand-in for everybody without thinking of her as an individual. And I mean, live in Manhattan, and well, I live in Manhattan and in Cambridge, but when I'm in Manhattan, it's the same thing to some degree in Cambridge as well. If I meet someone in my neighborhood, neighborhood, I find that I see them all the time after that. Before, I've probably been walking past them all the time, but I didn't know them. I had no connection. And then you meet them, and then you wonder about them if you don't see them in their normal haunts. If, you, if the kid is with them or not with them, you wonder, oh, I wonder where the kid is. You have a stake in them when you meet somebody, when you know them. And what happened, what occurred to me then, when I was thinking about all that had happened around the controversy and the, the DNA and all the uh, questions after that, was that perhaps I could do something that would make people understand this family, to have a stake in these people, to know Sally Hemings and her brothers and her sisters, not just as generic enslaved people, but as Sally and James and Robert and Elizabeth and Mary and all the various people who lived on, at Monticello. And I had an advantage because there are lots of records about the family that come from Jefferson, who was an inveterate record keeper, not only a letter writer, but kept memorandum books, what he called them, his memorandum books, records of all of his purchases every day, and the amount where he is from the time he was in his 20s to his 80s. And fortunately, those things are online now. Uh, one of the greatest achievements, I think, in Jefferson scholarship that Cinder Stanton and James Bear uh, contributed was 
putting together the mem memorandum books, doing notations, everything, just a wealth of information, one of the most valuable things that we have. And there's lots of information about the Hemings family there. There's information about um, the, you know, the Hemings family and other people as well. I mean, the Hemingses are the most known family of, of, at Monticello. I was in Detroit last night at the African American Museum to talk about uh, the exhibit that they have there, the slavery at Monticello. It was actually quite controversial in, in, in Detroit. The exhibit first came out at the Smithsonian a few years ago, and they've been to Dallas, and they've been other places, and it was sort of welcomed and to much acclaim. And then about three weeks ago, I discovered that there's a huge, there are pickets, people picketing outside the museum, and wanted the exhibit taken away and thought it was insulting and so forth. So I, you know, I sort of thought, wow, you know, I've never been to the African American Museum in Detroit. That'll be great. The exhibit's there, I'll get to see it again, and this will be fun. And then all of a sudden I realize I'm walking into a hornet's nest. Um, but I was there the other night, and it turned out it's fine. M my fans showed up. Um, <laughs> but that was mainly who showed up, so it was, it was, it was a nice night. It sold a lot of books, it was great. Um, but the exhibit has other families, the Grangers, the Hemingses, the Gillettes, the Hearns, all of these other people who lived at Monticello. And one of the benefits of uh, record keeping, obviously, is that you have information about people that you typically would not have in one place. And the other thing, too, is that most people who lived at Monticello, most enslaved people who lived at Monticello, lived there all of their lives. In the 1790s, starting in the late 1790s, and certainly a process that accelerated in the first decades of the 19th century, a lot of enslaved people were sold away from the Upper South to the Lower South. And so this experience of family dislocation, family separation, those kinds of things that became endemic in some ways to the experience of enslaved people really didn't happen at Monticello. And it was even more true with members of the Hemings family for a reason that, I mean, you have the book, I'm sure many of you know. Jefferson's wife was a half sibling to six of members of the Hemings family. So Sally Hemings' half sister. So Jefferson saw these people through the prism of his connection to his wife. And they were different. And they were not the kind of people, it, you know, Jefferson was not selling a lot of people. In, in the 1790s, he sold 85 people. He transferred 85 people to pay the debts of his, his um, father-in-law. Now, it's too complicated to know why he became liable for those. It was sort of a, a mistake that he and his brother-in-law, brother-in-laws made, but they became liable for the debt. So that's the last time that he transfers and the largest transfer of people. After that, the people at Monticello are the same. When he does his records, they're the same people year in and year out. And the Hemingses are certainly, as I said, the people who are definitely there. And I had an advantage because of his record keeping, and because they are in one place for 50 years, I can document the generations of the family in that particular place. Now, this is important because Monticello is not just the home of Thomas Jefferson. That's the sort of tagline that they use most of the time for the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. But they are now trying to broaden the experience because they understand that at any one time Jefferson is on the mountain, he is there with upwards of 200 other African American people. His daughters might be there as well with him and a few white working men. But Monticello is largely a predominantly black community. And it's hard to think of community when you're thinking of enslaved people, but it was that, a community of people, a family, families of people who knew one another. Jefferson is important, but their relations with one another, how they went about that world, 
about went about doing things in that particular world are worth knowing. Right now they have a house tour, the famous Jefferson House tour, but about 20 years ago they started what they call the plantation community tour that people can take. Now people say, why don't you put them all together? Uh, well, that's kind of tough. <laughs> Can't herd lots of people to two hours worth of you know wa walking. I mean, they would never. I mean, they, it's sort of a constant churn there with getting people in and out. So most people choose to do one or the other, or they choose both of them, but they're not incorporated together. The house tour requires them to talk about slavery in every room of the house, so it do just doesn't become you know house beautiful architectural digest kind of world of Jefferson and look at this gadget and look at this wonderful piece of, you know, um, dinnerware. Uh, it is, this is how enslaved people were incorporated into this particular society. So they have that, the plantation community tour along Mulberry Row. How many people have been to Monticello? Oh, everybody's been to Monticello. I'm talking to people who know this. Um, Mulberry Row outside of the mansion there where they have reconstituted a couple of the buildings, which is a very, very controversial thing to do. I'm on the uh, advisory board of the International Center for Jefferson Studies and also um, advisory board for, Ac uh, for African American uh, presentation at Monticello. And I'm sort of perennial on this. At some point, my, my, uh, my tenure never seems to end. Um, <laughs> but I can remember way back when that was a very controversial decision to put up cabins. Um, number one, the people who are guarding the site are concer were concerned about erosion. It's the side of the hill there, they didn't want anything that might um, you know, hasten that process. And the other thing was, well, can anybody else think about what the other problem was? Why people would not want to reproduce a cabin? Well, reproducing. She was saying if people didn't hear her, representing slavery for people who were uncomfortable uh, about it. Anything else? I'm sorry, I'm turning this to a law school class. But. Well, some people would not like that. That's the suggestion. Some people might not like that. Making it a tourist attraction? Well, it is a tourist attraction. <laughs> <laughs> but even more so, maybe that's a part of it. Uh, is it like, like a zoning issue? Zoning issue? No, they, they, they do what they want up there. Um, <laughs> tarnishing Jefferson's image? Well, uh, They didn't know exactly what the cabins look like. And they are complete sticklers for accuracy. And so we don't know what they look like exactly. They know the measurements of them. But what do they look like? And so they were concerned about that. And I was concerned. Well, the reason they thought about doing it is that they, were, they, heard, they heard from a woman who was a visitor there who said that after going through, she said, it's like we've been erased. You know, we, there's nothing there. There's the big house that looks in a way that he never saw it look. <laughs> because they got the right paint jobs, they got, they got a staff of people who are making sure everything is just perfect. Um, and then you have sort of an empty space out there. So people, and that was really poignant, that really found, people found that affecting to think that African Americans were coming up to, what is a slave plantation? I mean, it's kind of hard to think of it that way. Because I'm up there all the time, I was up there last week, and you're walking around and it's so beautiful, and you say, wow, you know, I could do this. Wait, what am I talking about? You know, this is, it's a plantation, and you, that's missed. Because if you look down from Jefferson's, um, um, the South Pavilion there, towards the Blue Ridge Mountains, you see trees. But at his time, the trees would not have been there. Those would have been fields. And there would be people out there working in the fields. And you can't 
see that. It's hard to imagine that. It's just this beautiful vista when you're up there. And so when you don't have the concrete thing, she said it's like we're being erased. And so they started thinking about um, reconstituting some of the buildings on the mountain. And you know, I acquiesced into that as, as, as well. I was concerned that if they built them, the thing, it's a tough thing because the people who built them, John Hemmings was a master carpenter joiner. He would have built a very nice house for himself, right? And I was thinking, okay, we're gonna have these in cabins for enslaved people and they're gonna look like little homes and untuck it <laughs> or someplace, you know, it's a little thing, you know, and I, that's what's gonna happen. And the first time I went there uh, and saw one of them and the people went in and came out and I swear, the guy said, well, that wasn't so bad. Oh. And I thought, oh man. But then, but they try, but they do in fact remind people and they do it in the, with, the, with the panels and the discussion that this looks nice and tidy, but imagine this cabin for another family. John and Priscilla had no kids, so it was just the two of them. But imagine this other house with eight people in it or six people in it. So it's not a luxurious kind of thing. And I think they do enough of a job, with, a, good, a good enough job with interpretation that they explain that this, is not so bad, is not great. <laughs> it's a situation that's not great. So they've built these things now and built these places now and they have a different orientation about it because the idea is that you want to try to make the mountain live in a way as much as possible. You can't have the smells and the garbage pit and those kinds of things, but enough of a sense of what it was like that it was not just about Jefferson up there writing and you know, riding around looking at his farms, there were people there working and doing all kinds of things that made the place exactly you know, what, it, what it was. And because of who he was, we have these records, we have these places, because he has a shrine, it is probably, it and Mount, Mount Vernon are probably the most prominent plantations that people know and that people visit because school children are brought up there and they have educational programs, programs and so forth for them. So it's really important to get that right. Last year, maybe, I guess the anniversary would have been, well, uh, well just a few days ago, they opened a new exhibit at Monticello, an exhibit about Sally Hemings. And it uses the place where they think she lived for a time not reconstituting it. They've actually reconstituted, as I said, John and Priscilla Hemings' house because they happen to find a letter from one of Jefferson's grandchildren, granddaughters, who described what the inside of the cabin looked like. And so they were able to really, using her re recollections, create something that they could plausibly say, this is what somebody who was in there said it was like. Can't do that with Sally Hemings' room the place that they're saying is Sally Hemings's room. So it's basically a place where you tell her story. And one of the things that I found really the most effective about that, affective I should say about it, was that my whole purpose in writing the first book was to get people to take Madison Hemings's recollections seriously. It's a rich resource of information, not just about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, but life at Monticello, the nature of slavery, his own life, his progress through life as a person on the plantation who was the son of the owner of the plantation. There's great information about Jefferson, really important information about Jefferson that was ignored for many years because you remember, as I said, people were looking at the bottom line what is the purpose of this document? Does this document say he didn't do it? In which case we will credit it. If it's saying he didn't do it, we're not gonna, we did do it, we're not gonna pay any attention to it. So lots of information about Jefferson's personality and his habits don't appear anywhere, don't appear anywhere or you know, 
for purposes of, of, uh, of biographies. A smooth and even, and the things that he says can be corroborated in other places, but it never joins those other documents as part of the story. That one is left out. Jefferson's smooth and even temperament, he says. Um, he never let himself, he never let himself be made unhappy for any great length of time, Madison Hemings said. And then there, that goes with um, a story about Jefferson, um, the dam that he's built washes away. And there's a visitor, George Ticknor, I think he's from New Hampshire, um, is visiting him and is talking to him and his overseer comes in and whispers something in Jefferson's ear. Jefferson sort of nods and he goes on talking. And the next day when Tickner is leaving, he finds out that this dam has been washed away and all of, and all of Jefferson's crops have been destroyed. And yet the answer and his overseer in another recollection tells this story as well and says, Jefferson says, well, okay, next year we have to do it this way. We have to build it this way. Everybody else was, ah, and it was just sort of, okay, there's a problem, here's the solution, this is what we're gonna do. That goes along with what Madison Hemings says about a smooth and even temperament and not letting himself be made upset or unhappy is the word he used for any great length of time and describes him as uniformly kind to everyone. Now that sounds good in a way, but my co-author and I, uh, in our book, Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, which is a quote Jefferson about himself, this is not me saying this about him, um, that that uniform kindness seems like a great thing, but it's also a distancing thing as well. If you're treating everybody exactly the same and you're being nice to everybody, is that a way of keeping a, a barrier? You know, you're not showing yourself in a way, your true feelings about things. His grandson said that he never talked about anything that he didn't want to talk about. He just sort of changed the subject. Um, and he could do that because he was the patriarch <laughs> at that time. This is, we're, not, we're just not gonna talk about this. We're gonna go forward. And those kinds of things that you could use what Madison Heming says, what Israel Gillette Jefferson says about Jefferson and have that creep into the historiography as well. I think now, well I know now, people are having a different look at those recollections, at those reminiscences. Um, because they do contain information, not just about enslaved people, which is very, very important, but also you know Jefferson better when you look at him not just through the eyes of his family or his, you know, his white family, but other enslaved people as well. I mean, that's how you really get to, in some ways, get to know someone. I would love to talk to uh, the people who are the servants of individuals rather than just their kids or their, you know, their near relatives. What is this person like? How does this person conduct himself when he or she has power over people? How far do they go? What are the restraints they have? Do they exercise restraints? What is it? And so the fact that they are actually using Madison Hemings' recollections in this space is important. I think not just for the story of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, but about slavery. It's a message that you can listen to what African American people who were enslaved said about their lives. Um, oral history is what most people have, and oral history has its good points and its bad points. I mean, Madison Hemings' statement is often characterized as oral history, but it's not really oral history. He's actually at Monticello. This is not like a story that someone's great grandchildren are telling about what happened at Monticello. He's a witness, he's there. But there is oral history from the, the, um, the Hemings family and other people about life at Monticello. And strangely enough, Cinder Stanton, whom I mentioned before, and Diane Swan Wright, who, are, who did this program called, or this this effort at Monticello called Getting Word to find out about Monticello through discussing the family histories of people who were descendants of those enslaved at Monticello said that one of the reasons people remembered 
Monticello was because of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Even people who aren't in the family remember that story, and it gave them a hook in some way to, to remain relevant, to have that, that was a relevant story that helped them, that sort of became a fixture of their family life because of that connection. So the oral history has to be checked against documentary evidence. Sometimes these things work out, and sometimes they don't. But to dismiss it out of hand is, I think, you know, there's no reason to do that other than that. You know, maybe people don't want to find these stories or don't want to consider these stories. Stories that are in family letters, even from contemporary family letters, can be inaccurate as well. Those things have to be corroborated. We, we sort of sometimes privilege family letters. That's how uh, the Jefferson grandchildren were given authority over this particular story because they're writing it down and they are members of the legal family and they're sort of giving like an ownership interest in these stories. But all of this stuff has to be corroborated. It has to be looked at and it has to be considered and tested against um, other evidence and had all of this particular evidence weighed. So I've had a really, I guess a unique, well, it's I don't, well, what a, a unique experience to have something that you said tested by science, <laughs> something that doesn't come up very often. And I've been fortunate to actually have people take what I said and use it. It's, you know, I've helped along with other people as well, the work of Cinder Stanton and Diane Swan Wright to change the story at Monticello. And in doing that, changing in some ways the story about Jefferson. Now I'm cognizant of the fact that once I have, you know, once I had put this out there, I wondered, well, what would this mean for him? What would it mean for the way people viewed Jefferson? And I think for the most of the time, most people in, in, in America, I would say most non-historians didn't really have a problem with the story. When I, you know, Fawn Brody wrote this in 1974. She talked about this in her, her book, Thomas Jefferson and Intimate History, and it became a bestseller. Barbara Chase Rubu wrote a novel, Sally Hemings. That became a bestseller. It was really historians who did not care for the story, uh, mainly Jefferson biographers and people who wrote in the early American Republic who did not like this story. And it was portrayed as a sort of romantic thing in a way. Thinking about the timing, I think thinking about when something comes out and how people respond to it. And we're in a very different moment now. We're in the moment of Me Too. So I was thinking about it mainly in terms of how people originally, how people would view the racial implications of all of this, because a number of the people who were originally concerned about it were concerned about this idea of race mixing. That was at the heart of a lot of their trouble with the particular story. But now, and this, this is, tells you about history, how everything is seen through the lens of your particular moment. We were in one moment then, and now we're in a different moment. And the question is, wait a minute, what about consent? You know, can this person say no? How do you view, we, we even argue about, or people argue about whether you should use the word relationship to describe this. It's hard for me, I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> and because I don't know what else, I mean relationship doesn't necessarily mean automatically means something positive. You're just describing, you can have a relationship to all kinds of things. So that isn't, you're not sending a signal there. People talked about mistress. Can you use the word mistress? And we're sort of policing language now in ways that are, you know, I have some issues with. But I, enslaved mistress, to my mind, tells you what we're talking about here. Enslaved modifies that term. And um, I don't have a difficulty with that, but there are some people who say that's completely off limits. So I guess my point is, I've entered a different world. <laughs> I thought I, I sort of you know, wrote my books, both of them, 
they came out, the DNA came out, there was sort of a change in people's attitudes about it, and I was still sort of thinking about things in 1990s terms. Um, but now we're in a different era, and we're thinking about, well, how, what, do you, what do you do with this? How can you uh, absorb this kind of information? Uh, is she a symbol? Is he a symbol? Do we use the word relationship? Do we use the word mistress? What are we conveying when we do that? Are we telling their story the right way? And quite frankly, I don't really know where we're going with all of this. I mean, Jefferson has had sort of ups and downs since he was president. There were always people who hated him. There were always people who loved him. And he's a controversial figure over the, been a controversial figure over the years. And Right now he is, he's still a controversial figure. And I just, I have to say, I really don't know where this is going. So you sort of, as a historian, you put something out there and it has a life of its own and you just never know where it will end up. But it's been a great ride. I've enjoyed all of it, except that year where I was waiting for the DNA. <laughs> um, besides that, uh, it's been wonderful to meet people. And I, I was so afraid when I went down to Virginia uh, after my first book came out that people would be incredibly hostile. And instead, more often, I had people who came up and told me about their family stories. This has opened up a lot in the South, in particular, because there were people who knew that their great, great, great grandfathers had two families and one you know, on both sides of the color line. They understood that. They knew that they had cousins who were part black, but they never talked about it. Black people always knew that. And I mean, there were some white people who knew it and maybe just sort of hid it. But if you go to a black family reunion, the people are all different colors, all different hair textures, all different everything. So you can't, there, was, there could be no way of pretending that none of this stuff happened and that the only time it ever happened was the traveling salesman or whatever, stories that they wanted to tell about anybody but the person we like. Um, whites could hide from that much more, but m uh, more often than not, I had whites who came up to me and told me about their family stories. And so from this group of people, I mean, I hope, that was my hope, that this could be extended out and we could have a national conversation about what it means to be an American. That America has never been just a white country. It's been a multiracial country. I know people, multicultural place, I know people don't like that word, but it's literally been that from, actually been that, I should say, from the very, very beginning. And I think the story of the Hemingses and people at Monticello make that plain.